And we're back after a winter long break. Because winter was hard for all of us. Um, right, Nick? Oh, that's for sure. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Yeah, it is nice to be at the start of spring. And I was just saying that we've got a little drizzle happening outside of Bedelford right now. I take comfort in that. Yeah? Indeed. Please introduce yourself. I'd be happy to. Uh, my name is Nick Barr. I am a proud graduate of CHID from 2004. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I have a couple of roles in CHID. I am the director of study abroad in CHID, which is a staff position. So we get to hang out in the office all the time together for that. And I'm also a part-time lecturer, which is a fancy term for instructor. <laughs> well, congratulations on all of that, Thank <laughs> especially <you. laughs> having you in the office. It's nice to be around people again. It is a real pleasure. Yeah. So today, our topic is the Netherlands, mm. which is a place you lived in for a bit. For a bit. Yeah. yeah. Want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah. And it's always hard to know what counts exactly as living somewhere, I think. Okay. The longest stretch I've ever been there was for six months. Mm -hmm. And at the time, uh, I was still really a learner of Dutch. Of course, it's a place you can go to without speaking any Dutch whatsoever and get along just fine. Mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the major cities, 99% of people speak English really well. Okay. And um, uh, so it's, it's not really necessary to, to know Dutch. There are people who live there for years and years and uh, hardly learn more than a word. Yeah. Um, but I do think that as you get to know a language better, then you start to understand a culture better. And there are things you, you, you probably miss if you, if you don't have that. So obviously I got a lot better at Dutch while I was living there, although I still felt... By the time I had left, you know, there were still parts of it that were inaccessible to me. Um, well, yeah, you're not a native. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And I still find that, you know, my Dutch has continued to improve, mm -hmm. but it's very easy still to have the experience of being stumped yeah. uh, in another place because there's slang and some of that it can be very, you know, regionally specific or even city specific, like Amsterdam has its own kind of dialect mm. um, and, and sort of the other cities. And so if you're from the Netherlands, you can sort of pick up on those differences, whereas I can maybe hear some of them, but I don't, I wouldn't be able to necessarily recognize them. Yeah. Can you describe that? Like the Amsterdam dialect um, as opposed to oh, like, gosh. I don't know, South yeah. Holland dialect. I, I don't know. If, well, I'm not sure that I can even recreate them my, myself. Um, okay. I do know that the southern part of the country the basically the language starts to sound a bit softer as you get closer to flemish which is the version mm -hmm. that's spoken in uh northern belgium and so that i can sort of pick up i think that there's there are certain differences there basically the thing that that dutch is very distinctive for it's not unique but it has a mm -hmm. lot of kind of guttural sounds mm. which um you know, can be kind of unappealing, I think, uh, to English speaking uh, or hearing ears. Yeah. Uh, but which I, I find kind of uh, endearing. Okay. Uh, sort of a lot of <sighs> kinds of sounds. <laughs> <Funny>. <laughs> so if you want to, if you want to speak Dutch, you have to, um, you have to work on your. <sighs> uh, people always joke that it's like hawking a loogie. <laughs> and so there's this famous myth that mm -hmm. during World War II. They, when the Dutch resistance was trying to search out for sp Nazi spies, infiltrators, okay. that yeah. they would uh, give them a test, which was if they could say the name of this very famous beach in The Hague, Den Haag, mm -hmm. and the name is Scheveningen. And so for the Germans, it's very hard to make that kind of sound, so they say Scheveningen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the giveaway. <laughs> It's really funny. <laughs> hmm. I have thoughts on this. Yeah? I don't know where to start because that's a lot of context you threw at me. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Moving fast. <laughs> I guess what I want to know is 
I guess, the sayings they have in Dutch. Like, you know, they're very different than, like, English I idioms or something. Uh, and it's always fascinating to me, like, what translates as what in other countries. Right. Like, you know, um, I studied abroad in Korea. Right, and I know. But one thing that's uh, stuck out to me the most is that the way they say, how are you, is, have you eaten? <laughs> Have you eaten? Have you eaten? Oh. Yeah. Like, uh, they made it a point to tell us that, like, the first time um, I arrived there. And then that's all I could think about. Was, like, wow, these people are asking me if I've eaten a lot. Ah, uh, interesting. <laughs> uh, is there anything like that in Dutch or any funny phrases that um, maybe lose translation um, when they're translated to English? Yeah, there's some like that. And then, you know, because of the hegemony of English, there are a lot of mm -hmm. things that have... Uh, taken over the Dutch language itself and sort of migrated either just directly from English or uh, sort of turned into Dutchlish, like uh, yeah. uh, the verb to, to write an email is emailing. Um, <laughs> and, you know, cuss words are very often just taken verbatim from uh, sure. English to, to Dutch. Um, but they have, they have some, yeah, they have some appealing ones too, like... Um, uh, to tell someone to shut up, you say, how are you back? Like, hold your beak, <laughs> basically. It's funny. Um, they have some other ones that are really um, offensive. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, really kind of disturbing ones, actually, where uh, I'm trying to remember what I've learned about the reasoning for this, but if you... Uh, other ways of insulting people include wishing illnesses upon them. Okay. Just really kind of upsetting I think I'm not even sure if I want to repeat them here on, no, on the podcast yeah. because, you know, these are real things that uh, people actually have as illnesses. So to use that as an insult seems... Uh, it's a lot. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. a lot. <laughs> cool. Well, now we're going to go into the nitty gritty here uh, since we're already on the topic of taboo or just downright offensive. <laughs> um mm -hmm stuff and culture uh so you told me to read the foreword of the translation for the book Jin that you did uh back in 2020 uh yeah it was published in uh the beginning of 2021 mm -hmm. yes uh and in it you talked a lot about uh cultural assimilation and its relation to um just this non-recognition of POC and Muslims there. Uh, do you want to break that down a bit? Sure. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly what I said about cultural assimilation there. Um, the Basically what I was trying to give some context for uh, as, as an introduction to, to that book mm -hmm. is uh, really to break down a common misperception that I think a lot of people have of of the Netherlands and of Europe in general these days. Um, and a lot of that comes from, you know, again, it is in some ways a result of the hegemony of, of the United States and uh, the impact of U.S. imperialism across across the globe and, and how that really frames a lot of global conflicts these days. Um, but the, the landscape, the political landscape and cultural landscape of the Netherlands has changed, um, so much since the 1990s and especially in the aftermath of the 9-11, okay. uh, attacks. And from that, a lot of people, I think, have, uh, a distorted understanding of, some of the political and cultural conflicts that exist in the Netherlands and in other European societies today, yeah, yeah. where they're, they're imagined to be intrinsically uh, and homogeneously white, um, going back into kind of mythical, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, pre-modern history, basically. Mm. And then that's framed as a brand new conflict then with how do European societies then um, engage with uh, people from who are not 
uh, supposedly, you know, part of those societies. And yeah, yeah. This is there's a famous uh, you, you've probably um, heard of um, the political scientist Samuel Huntington, who had this mm. uh, famous argument about the clash of civilizations. Okay. A very influential. Uh, kind of text actually it just came up in the news again I think in a Ross Doubt Hat column yeah. for for the New York Times where he he's sort of saying that yeah we can see now that Huntington was really right there are these fundamentally different civilizations and they have different cultural values mm-hmm. and um, as U.S. Uh, hegemony kind of recedes then we're seeing that these these different kind of cultural systems conflict so it's the problem, of course, is that it tends really in the, the direction of cultural essentialism. Mm-hmm. And so it people make generalizations about uh, uh, Muslim people in general who, you know, are from many, many different uh, cultures across the entire globe. Yeah. Um, and then there's a kind of essentializing that happens where anyone who is Muslim or is even perceived as Muslim is believed to hold mm-hmm. a certain set of assumptions uh, about things like homosexuality, about feminism uh, and, and women's rights. Um, and these are thought to be incompatible with the mm. superior, in scare quotes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, values of uh, you know, liberal Western culture. Yeah. So I just really think that that is a complete mythology. Totally. It's wrong, you know, on its own merits. It's also empirically wrong in terms of uh, when you look at the um, the history of um, the Netherlands and, and other countries uh, themselves, mm-hmm. where um, actually people of color have been... Um, parts of and also interlocutors with uh, European cultures for, for many, many centuries. Sure. Um, and so to, to then suggest that somehow this is a, uh, a kind of new conflict that's there that has to be um, managed in some ways is, um, is really misleading, I think. The other thing that, if I can continue for a no, second, no, keep on going. The other thing that is then really disturbing, and this this links to the study abroad program that um, my friend Amy Peloff and and I uh, run for for Chid to to Amsterdam, is that um, often the concept of tolerance is used as a way to describe how this supposed conflict should be managed. So the assumption there is Mm -hmm. here are all these um, enlightened, liberal, tolerant, uh, white Dutch people, and they have to figure out how and to what extent they can tolerate um, people of color, Muslims, uh, immigrants, uh, who are Mm -hmm. assumed to be then other than and effectively less than this ideal that they themselves embody. Totally. Um, this is really misleading for a lot of reasons because mm-hmm. it's sort of, and you see why actually tolerance itself is a really problematic framework for thinking about this because it always assumes that there's one group, usually the majority, which then tolerates another group, right? But yeah. that to tolerate somebody means that you don't recognize them as being equal and you find something kind of, um, disturbing or unacceptable about them, and you have to decide how much you can tolerate them, right? Yeah. So, like, this is a completely, um, you know, in- inequitable and, uh, frankly, racist way of, of thinking. Very about. racist. Yeah. Um, and um, so, really, I'm trying to to kind of show how. This doesn't fit the empirical reality, and um, uh, and also uh, people who are um, not white mm-hmm. in the Netherlands um, uh, are also themselves Dutch, feel themselves to be Dutch, um, have their own understandings and 
of of what Dutchness means to them. Mm -hmm. And the goal for them isn't to just assimilate into the dominant culture, uh, which is itself problematic, right? I mean, to suggest that um, it's very easy, I think, for white Dutch people to kind of then blame all homophobia, all transphobia, all um, misogyny, uh, anti-Semitism, all these things are then projected onto these, you know, quote, other people. Mm -hmm. Whereas, in fact, there are all kinds of problems of um, gender inequality, of homophobia, of anti-Semitism, all of these things, right? You know, they permeate, um, you know, society in general. So mm -hmm. uh, that's an easy way of sort of like projecting all the problems onto this uh, this f kind of scary other. Do you have an exact example of a cultural moment uh, in the Netherlands that kind of ties to what you're saying? Uh, preferably like when you were there, what was like the, how can I say this, the political uh, discourse of your time there? Yeah, I, I'm trying to think if there's a specific moment I can point to. I mean, the thing that immediately comes to mind is that there's still a problem today in the media, for example, mm. where, you know, they, uh, the television program programming mostly happens there through actually state supported uh, media programming, sort of like PBS um, yeah. here in the United States. They, they have multiple channels, but, um, you know, in a certain way, it's a, it's a little bit more of a consolidated media picture. Mm. Okay. Well, who's on the political talk shows uh, yeah. where these things are discussed? This is changing a little bit in recent years, but by and large, it's basically, it's very common to have, you know, mantles, uh, <laughs> panels with, with all men, uh, or and mammals, uh, I like mammals. that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, or and and or all white people, mm -hmm. and so you know you get you know four white guys just sort of like riffing on quote the problems in the Muslim community or yeah. these kinds of things. So, um, so I think there's a, there's a lot of criticism of that, and and I think some uh, kind of halting recognition that. Uh, representation in the media needs to uh, to change to to reflect this even yeah. somewhat because it's so far yeah. off base right now. Uh, but there's a long way to go, it seems to me, as far as that goes. I want to know more about how all of these things that embody, um, I guess, the social cultural of living in the Netherlands, how that how can I say, embodies in like the everyday um, uh, natives there. Like, could you recall a conversation you were talking to someone and you're like, wow, that's a perspective on life? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in some ways uh, it's a very dense place. Mm. Um the you know overall the country itself is very dense the cities themselves which are concentrated you know primarily um in the western part of the country okay. are especially dense mm -hmm. and uh so in some ways i think uh, and they also have uh, somewhat different from seattle at least where they have a fair amount of what's called social housing which is publicly owned mm -hmm. and um tends to be a little bit less segregated socioeconomically. Okay. And so in some ways, I think people are, are a little bit forced to kind of uh, interact with each other shoulder to shoulder. Mm. Maybe like a place like New York a little bit. Okay. At the same time, uh, especially the last few decades, there's a huge wave of gentrification as well. So the, that's also changing and the city cores become much more expensive. Uh, increasingly, um, expatriates are, are living there, you know, people who are like 
uh, accountants or people working for multinational corporations mm-hmm. from the UK or from the US and other places uh, who can pay a lot more for housing in, in the city cores. Yeah. So just to some extent, that's also, <laughs> I think, disappearing uh, at, mm. the, at the same time. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to think of a, a specific example of an interaction that I had. I mean, it, honestly, it's been quite a, a while since I lived there. This The time that I spent six months there, that was in 2007, 2008. Okay. Uh, it was quite a long time ago. And since then, I've only really been able to visit for short periods with the, the study abroad program. Um, but, I mean, maybe I can talk about another kind of po- political, cultural issue that does touch on this. Yes, something that's very popular for people my age. Transportation. <laughs> oh, transportation. Okay, that's yeah. not what I was thinking about. But um, yeah, I mean, that is one of the things that I... I uh, one of the few things about Dutch culture that I, I really can admire uh, mm-hmm. um, without qualification. Yeah. It really is an amazing uh, system. And uh, in fact, I was just talking to a JIT student uh, this morning who... Uh, was on a study abroad program last quarter in London mm-hmm. and was taking a class on sustainable development with a, a Danish professor teaching in the UK. Yeah. Um, and side note, Danish not to be confused with Dutch. So <laughs> uh, people are sometimes confused about that. Danish, you know, Denmark, uh, Dutch, the Netherlands. I've been so, corrected before. Yeah, they're not, the, they're not the same. They're both little countries in kind of Northwestern Europe, but a bit different. Um, but Denmark, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think is pretty similar in terms of having a strong culture of bicycling uh, and a good infrastructure for that. Yeah. But um, the, the student, I don't know if I should mention them by name since I didn't ask permission. But, Probably not. Um, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, they were, as a good student would do, they were, they were asking these questions that the professor was not addressing, like not just what is sustainable development Mm -hmm. and why is bicycling good, but like, what would be the social and economic (laughs) and political barriers that would prevent us from having the kinds of mm-hmm. infrastructure that we might, uh, you know, desire to have. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think th- that's an important uh, context as well. Totally. Um, but as far as the infrastructure itself, it, it really is remarkable. I mean, uh, they, some of it is somewhat uh, recent. Um, I'm trying to think which city it was. I think it was... Um, uh, Groningen, which is a university town in the northeastern part of the country. Nice pronunciation. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, got the gutter all there. And uh, like many other uh, European countries in the post World War II period, they had this sudden economic boom. Mm-hmm. And as part of that, um, consumerism, cars became very popular. Well, they very quickly ran into huge problems with traffic deaths. Mm -hmm. So quite suddenly there was, I think, a left wing government in this in the city, Groningen, which instituted um, a whole change to the traffic system, which basically prevented cars from driving Mm -hmm. through the center of the city. Mm -hmm. So um, and they just sort of did this by fiat. I don't think that, you know, the drivers were very happy about this necessarily. but I think a lot of um, uh, the infrastructural thinking and, and urban planning is, is designed this way. So mm. um, uh, that it becomes very inconvenient, actually, to own and drive a car, at least in the cities. I mean, there are plenty sure. of cars in the suburbs and in the more rural parts of the country. Mm. But if you're just a, you know, um, typical person living in Amsterdam or whatever, you have a bicycle and that's pretty much how you get around. Or if not, then you're taking one of the many trams or the subway, the buses, et cetera. It just is be very impractical to try and get around everywhere in your, your cars. Faster uh, and easier to go on your bicycle. Yeah. So they have a great system of 
uh, separated bike lanes, uh, which is a real novelty here in, in Seattle now, and I'm glad to see more of it. But yeah. you just, it's, it's everywhere in the Netherlands. They always think about, it's almost as if they think first about where were the, will the bike lanes go so that people can get around on their bikes yeah. before they figure out where the cars are going to go. I'm pretty sure it ha- the country as a whole has the highest per capita bicycle ownership in the entire world. I think sense. it's like two bicycles per person. What? Right? <laughs> that's that's now, so that's, high. That's very high. Of course, this is also, you have to account for the fact that bicycle theft is a mm. you know, <laughs> major yeah. uh, industry there too. So, um, you know, bicycles get uh, do get stolen a lot there too. Okay. But, you know, you might have... Uh, like if you commute from one city to another, you might even just have a bicycle that lives in your work <laughs> destination. And then you take the, the train there, or the bus there, and then you take your bike and then you come back to the station and you leave it there. And then when you get back home, you take your other bike uh, back. Um, Hilarious. The, um, but yeah, it's such a contrast. I mean, I think, you know, as somebody who rides a bicycle here pretty often, mm-hmm. I also drive, but I, I bike to work usually. And the the example I always use is the Rainier Vista, you know, um, mm-hmm. down the way at the, yes. at the end of, of campus. Uh, you know, they spent, uh, the university spent a lot of money to develop that overpass to get to the light rail station. Mm-hmm. It's really beautiful. Um, but it's basically you have you have the lawn there and then you have the two pathways on either side which then crisscross like an hourglass kind of shape and then come back around and then the overpass has uh kind of one side which heads to the ramp that goes all the way down Mm -hmm. and then the other side goes to the light rail station yeah every time i go through there it's a mix of pedestrians and bicycles Mm -hmm. and Understandably, the pedestrians are not really aware of bicycles coming behind them and trying to get through. Yeah, you know, people are t- are on their phones or they're you know they're talking with friends or whatever. Yeah, perfectly legitimate pedestrian activities. But mm-hmm. then I sort of it's very stressful to get through there because yeah, you know, uh, as a biker, it's, it's your responsibility not to hit anybody. Obviously, sure. Um, but it, that's a good rule of thumb. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and not all bikers uh, follow that. Unfortunately, I, yeah. uh, I'm not necessarily a fan of other <laughs> bicyclists. <laughs> but uh, you know, you just in the Netherlands, you would not think to design a new building project that way. It's so obvious that you would put a bike lane over here and have people walk over here so that yeah. they're not running into each other. Totally. No, that's something I've seen in the videos where it's like. They even have bike lanes that go from the suburbs to the city, and there's like a good six feet of distance between each side. So it's like cars, passenger, uh, pedestrians, pedestrians yeah. and, and and you know people who bike. And although you know the biggest blame is structural. Like, like, it should be designed better here, and it should be a bit more clear who goes where. Uh, I also tend to find, that, you know, after visiting other countries, that the etiquette for not only um, bikes, but for public transportation in general, is so bad here. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Uh, just so I could go on a quick tangent. Please do. Yeah. Um, how people use the light rail in Seattle annoys me so much. It, like, the stations, it's like, you know, in Korea, people are very strict that, like, yeah. stay in one side, and then the left side is for people to go down or whatever. And I am, I guess, a quick pace person. So, like, I just I kinda, like that. <laughs> me too. So, I just kind of walk and, and run everywhere. Uh, and it annoys me that I can't go down the escalator faster because yes. there's like groups of people just clumped there. That is bad etiquette. I agree. Yeah, I'm just like, why? And 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 then I'm like, okay, maybe you haven't visited other countries, but also I feel like this should make sense. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Yeah, and I wonder, you know, some of it I think is mm-hmm. lack of practice too. I mean, yeah, uh, uh, I know that you didn't 
grew up in Seattle, but light rail is, is quite new here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think also, uh, you know, with bicycling too, There's there's been a huge upsurge in the number of people who bicycle. I mean, when I grew up here, I mean, I biked because I was a kid and that's how I could get around. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but other than that, it was not very common, except for people who like to bike recreationally on the Burke Gilman Trail yeah, and things yeah. like that. Now that there are more people using it to get around, uh, I think we're in this somewhat messy intermediate zone where drivers are not necessarily so used to dealing with bicyclists mm. on the road and it is more congested. Yeah. And so people just kind of mentally freak out because they don't know who has the right of way or even kind of uh, bodily habits of how to uh, engage with the, you know, or with sharing space that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, d- to bring it back to the Netherlands, this is another thing with, uh, with the, the culture around biking is that this also affects how people drive because... Yeah. If you you're you're taught this from the time that you you take driver's ed, if you hit a bicyclist, it's your fault. Good. All pretty much no matter <laughs> what. So that means you and because there are bicyclists everywhere, people get used to that and they know how to be careful around it. Yeah. Um, have you ever heard of the Dutch Reach? No, it is that. Yeah. Um, this is something where. Um, This is actually being promoted for driver safety here in the U.S. now. Mm -hmm. And it's something that's taught as a standard thing in the Netherlands where when you are uh, a driver and you're getting out of your car, there's always a risk, right? If you just swing your door open without looking because you don't see a car coming, a bicyclist could be right there and they could run into your car door, right? Yeah. Very dangerous. Yeah. I think bikers even call it being car doored. Um, so in the Netherlands, rather than just using your, you know, usually you would use your left hand to open mm-hmm. the door, you have to reach over with your right hand. And this kind of naturally mm. forces you to look and make sure there isn't a bike coming yeah. before you open oh, that's the door. Smart. And of course it becomes, if you learn to do it that way, it's sort of second nature. It's not a thing you have to... Yeah. I gotta think Dutch now. <laughs> it, it's definitely more effort, though. You can't cross your think open. It, yeah. yeah, but I think it's only effort because you we we would be thinking about doing it consciously. Okay. I think yeah. you know if it becomes kind of your part of your uh, habitus, then you know you you would just do it automatically. Yeah. So it's like second nature. <laughs> Another thing I like about um, I guess that part of the country, uh, country world. <laughs> Uh, that we don't have here in regards to cars is roads that change in material uh, mm. depending on what section you're you're mm-hmm. at. Uh, so like it subconsciously tells you this is for pedestrians. Yes. Like over there, they have like a lot of roads that are like brick and just not designed for cars, which tells the driver you're not supposed to be here, basically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you know, contrast to somewhere over here, like the most walkable area here is the u district i would think uh and even then everything is kind of designed as though you're supposed to like just blaze through it uh, even if it is slower technically uh it's just the roads are the same as any other road mm-hmm. uh, yeah. and that in itself you know i have seen people get hit just like outside my apartment of like, yeah like yeah yeah it, and I'm sure that like the risk for that over there is lowered because of those conscious decisions and road design. Yeah, it's true that the I mean the the bike paths them away have a distinctive color. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like a brownish red. Okay. It's the same. Uh, I don't know what material it is, but it's kind of that same textured um, material that they use for the green bike lanes here. Okay. So it's really smooth and easy to, to oh. bike on, yeah. which is nice. And it is also visually demarcated from the pedestrian sidewalk. Yeah, so You do have these issues where tourists, especially when they first get there, mm-hmm. they don't know the difference between the two. And so they will accidentally walk across the bike lane and not realize that they're in, in the wrong. Yeah. The, the, the bicycle is, is king <laughs> or queen. 
and <laughs> um, uh, and so that can lead to some difficult encounters. But yeah, again, a, a pretty big success story. I think they've uh, you know in a country with that like thirty million bicycles, right? Yeah, they I think they have on average something. Uh, th I'm, this might just be for the city of Amsterdam. I think they had like six bicycle fatalities per year. It's kind of low Something on this like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, be, if you look at the numbers just for Seattle, which is a comparably <laughs> sized city, I think it yeah. is, unfortunately, is, is significantly the worse. Percentage is way up, I'm sure. Yeah. <sighs> Well, let's end on a happy note. That's a good idea. Yeah. Um, the best thing you tasted in the Netherlands. Oh, right, this is another thing where I have I have many loves. Um, the thing, okay. Sometimes people ask me for recommendations if they're mm -hmm. visiting, and there's one place that I especially like. Which is, it, I know it appears on tourist suggestions too. So, mm -hmm. you know, whether you can describe it as purely, quote, authentic, okay. I don't know. But that itself we could interrogate if we had more time, what's authentic. <laughs> All right. But um, there is a place called Cafe Winkel. Okay. Uh, Winkel with a W. Okay. And um, it, it, it's on a nice little square. And they are famous for apple chabak, <laughs> What's that? which is uh, basically apple cake. Ooh. Um, or sort of a, I don't know if it's p more pie or cake. It has a crust. Um, and so you get that with, uh, and then you have to ask for slachrom on top, whipping cream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it really is delicious. I, I go there pretty much as often as I can. Okay. And there was one student we had on the first Amsterdam study abroad program we did in 2015 who became so obsessed with this cake that he started offering to buy it for other people on the program just so that they would go with him oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he tried to go almost every day Funny. which is probably not the healthiest choice but no <laughs> when you're biking everywhere it works out well i'm sure the sugar content there is a lot less than over here I don't know about that. Mm, okay. There's plenty of sugar sugar in it, um, but it's worth it. It's worth it. All right. If I'm ever there, I'll, I'll remember. I'll take you there. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you so much, Lennon. Yeah. Do you want to plug anything in before we leave? Um, plug in anything. Hmm. I hadn't thought ahead about this. <laughs> that's okay. Maybe we should edit that out. <laughs> I should have come with a plug. No, Darn. that's funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll see you around the office and Chid and UW. And I hope you have a great spring quarter. Great. Thank you so much, Lennon. You too. I'll see you in the office. See ya.